Hi, this is Tom Golly. I'm at the University of Tokyo. Um, it's been two weeks since ChatGPT was released by OpenAI, and uh, shockwaves continue to <laughs> go around the world. Um, people continue to be um, amazed and kind of frightened at how how lifelike, how effective, how smart it is in some ways, um, and also how how stupid it is in other ways. But it really seems to be a big leap towards um, sort of human-like uh, AI. Um, naturally, there are a lot of concerns about it in terms of, well, will it be taking away people's jobs? Will it be used for um, fake news or for um, evil campaigns? And those, those issues aren't resolved. Um, but I would like to talk about an area of my own interest where I think maybe chat G GPT and similar programs that will certainly emerge soon um, have positive potential, which is in language learning and maybe language teaching. So I've made a couple of videos so far about um, how GPT, chat GPT might be used um, by language learners maybe language teachers, some successful in some ways, unsuccessful in other ways, but overall quite intriguing, quite fascinating in the, the, the what it can do, uh, its, its ability in some areas, um, linguistically, maybe even exceeds the average, average human, um, the average language teacher. And so um, I would like to think about that. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for language teachers and for language learners um, in the months and years ahead? So um, first of all, the, thinking about <laughs> how, how, how humans learn language. Um, so maybe we can f focus on, on, two, on two, two aspects of human language learning. So one is people learning their, our first language is children for the most part, um, learn their first language from uh, other human beings, so from their their family and from the, the kids around them, their teachers at school and things. So of course, these days, children get a lot of input from media as well, too, but I think it's that, that human interaction um, that is the primary driver of first language acquisition. But in the case of uh, second languages for you know teenagers or older, especially foreign languages, um, often that, that human element... Um, is has been lacking um, because it's it's a foreign language. There's nobody around you who speaks the language that you who want to learn, for example. And so the reason ChatGPT is so fascinating because it's so human-like. I'm just wondering if it's has the potential to um, serve that function of a human interlocutor, uh, the function of a, of someone that you can learn from the way I, ideally um, human language learning has taken place before, both for children and for adults. So, um, but before I, I think about that in a little more detail, I want to think about, well, I want to be cautious. Is that, am I just being fascinated by this new technology? Um, is, has, is, 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 I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, I'm kind of a nerd. I'm an early adopter of technology. Um, and it's, this has been only been available for two weeks, is am I running ahead of myself? So what I want to do first is think about the history of the adoption of technology, of new technologies into language education and language learning, because it goes a long way back. Um, and it has not always been successful. There have been a lot of failed attempts to uh, introduce new technology to language learning. So one, one, one that comes to mind immediately, of course, is printing the book. Um, and so this was a revolution in its time. It continues to be a revolution. Um, the, the ability to preserve language on paper and, and to transmit it over long distances. And then since Gutenberg, able to make many, many copies cheaply. And so beginning centuries ago, of course, language learning, second language learning, foreign language learning, um, was enabled for many people and, and, and driven by the existence of, of printed matter of books. And so that was, the books were a very excellent technology, but um, they were obviously, especially for language learning, they were inadequate in some ways. They're not interactive, obviously, but also they don't have an audio component. Um, so you can't 
hear what the sounds of the language are. I remember as a child, um, when I was interested in language, checking out books from the library on, I don't know what it was, classical Greek or, or French or something like that. And, and reading descriptions in the, in the introduction of the book, this is how the sound is pronounced in French or in, in Sanskrit or whatever it was. And it was uh, practically useless for me because I had not yet studied phonetics or linguistics and I had no audio recordings at that time to, to listen to. And so I, I could not imagine from the descriptions of the sounds how they were pronounced. So when, I think the real first arrival of early, early adopted technology was audio recording and broadcasting. So uh, with Thomas Edison and, and Marconi and others, when they found out that they could record the sounds of a language and, and or broadcast it over long distances, then, you know, this is a century ago, more than a century ago, there were a lot of efforts to apply that to language learning. This was uh, less than a century ago, but I remember in, when I was a child, we did have some um, LP records in my home in California. So this was 60 years ago. We had LP records of, I think it was French and maybe Spanish, that my, I guess my parents had bought. And I would put them on the record player occasionally and listen to them, you know, bonjour. I don't remember what it was, but it was a, uh, it was, it was, they had been bought. My parents had bought them. My parents had not learned anything from them. <laughs> the local public library had many, many recordings of language lessons, like sets of language educational materials, in which would be a set of LP records with uh, accompanying text. And I think a lot of people tried to learn from them. And some, probably some people did succeed in learning the language well, or at least getting a good start from those records. But overall, they were not a successful technology. They did not replace teachers. They did not lead to a, a, a big increase in foreign language learning anywhere in the world. Radio was used as well, too. Here in Japan, where I live, I think it's, it's close to 100 years since uh, broadcaster NHK has been broadcasting. I think it was in the 1930s that they started broadcasting um, English and other foreign language lessons on the radio. After World War II, when Japan was occupied by the... Um, American forces, there was a big boom in English language learning um, through NHK um, uh, radio. And it didn't have much of an effect. There were some people who did learn. I have one good friend who passed away a year ago um, who uh, learned English quite well, largely from listening to the radio as a child. But th those were exceptions. Um, and so that technology that seemed to offer so much promise to be able to spread language learning widely um, and cheaply um, didn't work very well. Later, I, I've, in my own life, I've experienced other ones. When I was in university in California in the 1970s, every classroom in the, in the university had these big television sets up on the wall, hanging from the ceiling. And um, they were all connected to a central uh, control room. In those days, it was not yet possible to record um, video on compact cassettes, and so they had these reel-to-reel, -reel, I don't know how big they are, about an inch-wide big tapes on reel-to-reel -reel machines in a central uh, location, where they could have classes, this was not only for languages, but also for other subjects, where they could have lectures, and the idea was you wouldn't have to have the human teacher in the classroom, the students would just go to the classroom, watch the television, get the lecture, get the education. It didn't work. In the three years I was at that university from 1975 to 1978, I never saw those televisions being used in any of the classrooms. It was a big waste of money. And so since then, I've experienced other introductions of new technology to language learning that did not succeed. Um, Computer-aided there were a lot of, in the 80s and the 90s, there were a lot of computer-aided programs for learning, and, you know, a few people, a handful of people were successful in learning from them, but it just didn't work. And so, um, you, probably many of you can think of other cases like that, where some, some, somebody like me, some, some educator, was very enthusiastic about, about some technologies, we're going to adopt this, and they, you know, you apply to the higher-ups, the administrators, the government officials, and they, it sounds attractive. This is the latest technology. So therefore, we will, we will um, give you some money to implement it in all of your schools, and it doesn't work, okay? The, often the technology is not ready yet. So um, 
So I'm, obviously now, audio technology, video technology, what I'm talking to you right now on YouTube is fantastic learning materials and it has become very, very easy to use and very easy to watch. But it, there are many cases in which it, um, things like video and audio and computer-aided learning were adopted much too early. But I think the reason they failed was not only the fact that um, the technology was too cumbersome or too expensive. Um, there was also the fact that those technologies did not involve human interaction. So, um, as I said, people learn languages from other people by interacting with other people. So both the linguistic input and the linguistic stimulation that comes from interaction um, is very, very important, but also the, especially the motivation to continue learning. So um, there are some people who can continue to study a language on their own for themselves, by themselves for, for the months, years that is necessary to become fluent. But most people need um, some encouragement along the way. So even if you're sitting in a classroom with 20 other, 30 other students, having that human teacher in front of the class looking at you and so occasionally responding to you and throwing questions at you. Um, and it seems to be the a major driving force the, uh, for allowing people to continue studying and learning languages for uh, the long time that is necessary to become proficient. So what I'm wondering is, does this AI, the AI that um, has, is starting to emerge, does it have the potential to replace, to some extent or to a large extent, the human element in language learning. Well, I think we saw a hint of this um, six years ago when uh, machine translation suddenly got a lot better. And so with, with Google Translate and now DeepL and others, um, it is possible to some extent to actually have uh, uh, communication between human beings using machine translation, using, using a spoken um, computer or uh, smartphone app interpreters. And so that, that was a revolution. Okay, not so much in teaching. Okay, machine translation can be applied in teaching. But I think it's a revolution in how humans use language. So before machine translation became moderately good, the only way for two people who don't have a common language, so two people who, who one person speaks Chinese, another person speaks French, and neither of them speaks each other's language, and they don't speak English or any other common language. The only way for two people like that to communicate, to cooperate, was to have a human intermediary. So there had to be one person, or it had to be somebody, uh, a translator, an interpreter, who would translate between them. That was a human being. Or um, one person would, <laughs> those two people would learn each other's languages or they would learn a common language. Okay, so the reason machine translation is, is, is a revolution is it enables communication, cooperation between people without a common language um, by computer, cheaply, <laughs> very cheaply and conveniently. Okay, it's not, uh, uh, accuracy has, still has problems, of course, and knowing how to use it um, uh, is, is, uh, is an important issue. But that showed, sh sh showed the light on how that could be used. Well, chat GPT, which we've just been able to experiment with for two weeks now, um, has it has brings a human element, even a bigger human element into that, a more important human element, in that the way it is able to con conduct very natural sounding conversations, and it will uh, you can you can ask it to ask you questions, and it will ask you questions, it will elicit information from you. It can explain language. It can explain the meanings. I've been especially amazed at how well it can explain the meanings of words and it can figure out the meanings of individual words from their context, which is a rather advanced skill for human beings. Many language teachers are not as good as ChatGTV in doing that in the case of English. It's not as good in the other language I've tested it on, Japanese, but it's very, very good with English. And so I think this is a tipping point for for language education and for language learning. So all of those previous technologies had largely, well, you know, they, they came too early. There were a lot of money was wasted, a lot of time was wasted, and for those who hope had hoped to replace human teachers in some teaching contexts, 
they all they were all disappointed. So the the learners themselves who who didn't have a teacher could not afford to pay a teacher, who hoped to be able to learn a language and acquire a language solely from the audio recordings or the or the smartphone apps. But most of them have 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 failed. It they, they didn't succeed. Some people have, but it, you just don't continue. Okay, and and it's just not the material is too hard or it's too easy. And it doesn't adapt to you, and it doesn't encourage you in any way. And so, what I see from this from this new AI, this interactive AI, um, is the potential for replacing most of that. So, in other words, I can easily imagine um, having a, a spoken bot, or maybe a bot that um, it appears both audio on your smart speaker, and it's also a, a, a an avatar that appears on your screen of your phone or of your computer. And then it, it, it's friendly, and it chats with you, and it says hello in the morning, and it remembers what you talked about yesterday and last week and two weeks ago. And um, it's also your language teacher. And so it, it will um, remember, for, for example, it remembers the words that you've studied before, it remembers the words that you already know, and it remembers which words you, you don't haven't acquired yet. Okay, So it's able to... You create conversations, have interesting conversations about topics, whatever you're interested in, in which it uses this vocabulary that that you need practice on. Okay, and so a human teacher cannot do that easily, right? You can, if you have, if you have a lot of experience with a certain kind of learner, you can adapt your speaking style to the sort of the. This is what you know. This is what junior high school students. In, in, in Malaysia, no in English. This is ones they don't know. And so you can adapt to some extent in that regard. But it's clear that, that programs like ChatGPT have the potential to, to um, adjust their teaching and their, their speaking, their interaction, in a way that is just enough to, to Im keep improving the, the, the learner's vocabulary, building the vocabulary, um, exposing them to different accents, um, uh, and also obviously grammatical forms as well too. And so it would, it would be able to do this in a fun, interactive way. And this, I can easily imagine them becoming virtual characters that would be sufficiently human-like, have warm enough personalities and interesting enough personalities to be attractive to you know, to, uh, to, to many, many, many users, okay? So some people will resist that. But, you know, there are many people, many young people these days who are quite into, you know, uh, uh, bots and, uh, and virtual characters. There's, there's this one called Hatsune Miku in Japan. It's a completely virtual character. They have concerts. You know, thousands of young people will go to these concerts to, to watch this virtual character on the screen. And I've heard they, you know, people get tears on it. They're seeing their, their virtual character in person. Okay, and so, so there's a, uh, and this will be individualized for, for you. Um, so obviously the applications are not restricted to language learning. And obviously there are many possible applications to, to this that, that need, that are causes of concern um, in terms of the political uses, uh, um, uses in fraud and many things like that. But narrowing our scope to, to language learning, uh, in which there has really has, always been a shortage of human teachers for language learning, um, especially for foreign languages, especially. And so it has, I think it has a great, great potential. So one concern, of course, so that many people will have people like, like me who have been language learners, uh, teachers who have made their money by language teaching. Well, will, do, will this mean the end of jobs for language teachers? Well, that, that, if people should be concerned about that. If you should think about that. Um, I don't think that should, is what should drive the conversation. Um, I, I, um, I, don't th I think language learning, language acquisition um, is more important than protecting people's jobs. But I don't think that these virtual um, characters, if they emerge, which they probably will, I don't think that those characters will replace the needs for human educators um, completely. But I do think the role of human teachers, um, at least in the case of languages, will, will, ha will change. And so the sort of the classical um, uh, language class 
in a junior high school, in a high school or university. Okay, you have 30 students in the class. There's one teacher. And the teacher says, okay, everybody, um, here, open up your textbooks to page 123. We're going to do lesson 52 today. Okay, could you please read the text and then repeat after this and answer this question and fill in the blanks in the, in the worksheet. Okay, when you have this kind of mass education like that, that, that kind of teaching is kind of unavoidable. Well, I, th I think the need for that and uh, the role for that was going to, going to disappear. So all of the students could be using their, their apps, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's at home someplace else, they will have their lessons that will be tailored for them, that will be interesting, and will be more interesting than that teacher reading from the textbook in front of the class. But on the other hand, the, the, the motivational element, the, much of the motivational element maybe will be offloaded to the apps, but to, you know, the, the element of you know, what role does this language play in my life? Um, why should I continue? Um, people will be modeling themselves uh, still on human beings. And so I think the role of the teacher will become more like a coach, okay, to you know, encourage and guide the students in their learning um, and, and motivate and continue to motivate the students. But much of the teaching and much of the, the, the sport for language acquisition probably can be done by, by, by this software. So it's it's a new world that's emerging. We we've, we've we've it's just it just has emerged in in this sense within a couple of weeks. There's is a danger that I'm being over optimistic. It's also possible that the that the sufficient sufficiently customizable um, software might not be available for some time. Um, it's not clear when Open API uh, Open AI is going to replete. Re release an API, an application program interface that will allow other implications, applications to interact with their program. That's what would be necessary. Also, it's not clear whether when um, competing versions of this, um, open source versions or commercial versions will emerge. But I think it's, it's almost certain. Um, the, it's, it's the potential applications in so many fields are, are are really, really intriguing. And, and so I think the technology was gonna improve. So as I said in my other videos, if you watch them to the end, um, and thank you for watching this one to the end as well too, uh, there's a lot we don't know. And we, there's a lot we have to try. And so I encourage language learners, language teachers to try this software and especially to talk about it with other people share techniques, share what, what succeeds, what doesn't succeed, um, what, how can, you can use it, what are, what, are, what, are, what are people's reactions to it, learners' reactions to it. Does it seem potential? Does it seem boring? And, and we'll have to move on from there. So thank you very much for listening to this far. I, this might be my last video on the topic, but I might come back in, in any case. But I do hope the conversation about this issue goes far beyond this, this room in uh, Yokohama, Japan and that people will be talking about it around the world. So thank you very much for listening.